welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this talk today. We're really excited to have uh, David Hughes here with us. Uh, I'll give a brief bio and then I'll pass it over for Dr. Hughes' very exciting talk. So um, David Hughes works as a professor of anthropology at Rutgers University. And as an activist scholar, Hughes has served as president of this union, Rutgers AAUP AFT, and currently sits on the Climate Justice Task Force of the American Federation of Teachers. In research and teaching, he explores ways in which people exploit each other while exploiting nature, environments, and indeed the entire biosphere. He has written ethnography, history, and public criticism on topics as diverse as settler colonialism, racism, slavery, land reform, climate change, oil, and renewable energy <coughs> in Southern Africa, the Caribbean, and the European South. He has written four books, including most recently, Who Owns the Wind? Climate Crisis and the Hope of Renewable Energy. He's also written numerous, numerous articles, and I really enjoyed reading a lot of his more recent Boston Review articles. They're more public-facing articles on his work, and I thoroughly recommend checking them out. Um, so without further ado, we've just really enjoyed engaging our work in my energy justice class and found that it's really accessible and um, also very rich in one. So thank you so much, Dr. Hughes, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, okay, let me just get myself installed here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's true. Right, right, right. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it was great to uh, to have an audience here, New Hampshireites, and thank you to the Irving Institute and to the Departments of Anthropology and Geography. Um, this is uh, sort of a thank you for mentioning the Boston Review articles. I just published one uh, last week called A Climate Strategy of Last Resort. Um, and that's a very legal juridical version of this talk, which is more ethnographic. So, you know, if you want to consult, if you want some background on the law stuff, it's a lot of it is in that paper. Um, so, 103 dawn in December 2019, five individuals walked onto a train bridge in New Hampshire and refused to leave. Other protesters had already advised Pan Am Railways of the hazard, and an engineer was holding 80 cars of coal some miles to the south. Similar actions had in fact delayed the same train all night in Massachusetts. There. The engineer was probably tired. His train was hauling West Virginian anthracite to be burned in New England's last coal-fired plant, the Merrimack Station in Bow, New Hampshire. A climate group known as No Coal, No Gas intended to shut that plant down. So these five bodies were on the line, one tied to the trestle, three sitting on the icy rail bed 30 feet above the Merrimack River, and one on standby as the police liaison. At either end of the bridge, in the lawful territory of Hookset, New Hampshire, Supporters of no coal, no gas cheered and chanted. Then the police arrived. In the spirit of shooting the messenger first, the officers of Hookset arrested the liaison upon sight and without the required warnings. Then with greater professionalism, police cuffed and removed the others. One officer twisted his ankle and all representatives of government were cold. <laughs> Not long afterwards, the five suspects went free on bail they plotted through New Hampshire's court system, soon all but paralyzed by COVID. In Hookset, the district court found them guilty of criminal trespass. The five appealed to Merrimack Superior Court in Concord, where they faced a jury in March 2022. In the courtroom, these activists endeavored to explain their act of conscience and to warn New England of the climate emergency. Judge Andrew Schulman disqualified most of that testimony. Trespass was trespass in his view, and he instructed the jury to follow his guidance in the law. The 12 New Hampshireites exonerated the liaison while convicting the other four defendants. Two months, two months later, while sentencing those four, Shulman mocked, Judge Shulman mocked their notions of conscience and civil disobedience, referring to the train blockage as a stunt. He did not send them to jail, but he imposed a strict parole that will keep them off train tracks for a good five years. That case, the first legal round in the ongoing fight against the Merrimack station is closed. 
I'd like to revisit, even relitigate the train protest. Things could have gone differently. The jury almost acquitted them or almost hung. Libertarians who were certainly on the, uh, were certainly on the jury in Merrimack County could have made the difference. That is my speculation, informed by fieldwork among climate activists and libertarians in New Hampshire. I discovered, in fact, that some of the climate activists and some of the libertarians agree on some things. They simply held incompatible identities and views of history. So I'll be the bridge here. I'll be the translator, the liaison, possibly the messenger shot on site, but also possibly the whisperer of a new broad alliance against state-sponsored fossil fuel infrastructure. And I should say, that's, that's the only part of it that I'll read. Um, this is kind of in the genre of what I call speculative ethnography, um, which is finding in, in the actual, in the present, some latent things, some unexpressed possibilities, which exist as possibilities. And what I'm going to suggest here, what I'm going to express here, is a thought experiment of what if one or two contingencies went differently and these possibilities became actual. So my replay here uh, of that trial goes all the way back to Ayn Rand, born in 1905 in St. Petersburg, and the leading, and in fiction, the leading exponent of libertarianism in the United States. Her characters embrace anarchism, creativity, and above all, individualism. They also live lives not very different from those of climate activists. Um, her Rand's emblematic hero is Henry Ward, Rourke, in, in her novel, The Fountain, from 1943. He commits a spectacular act of civil disobedience. He blows up the Cortland, this building, he's an architect. He blows up this building that he has designed, blows it to smithereens without hurting anybody, and then he turns himself into the police, and then he goes to jury trial, and he gives this speech. This is just a few lines of 20 pages. Uh, he says, observe the results of a society built on the principle of individualism. This, our country, the noblest country in the history of men. Ayn, Ayn Rand only ever had one third person singular pronoun, which was he, and all of her characters, even the women, are men. Uh, so I can't have to apologize for the gender of language. Anyway. Uh, the country of greatest achievement, greatest prosperity, greatest freedom. This country was not based on selfless service, sacrifice, renunciation, or any precept of altruism. It was based on man's right to the pursuit of happiness, his own happiness, not anyone else's. A private, personal, selfish motive. Look at the results. Look into your conscience. So in the novel, um, Rourke, Howard Rourke says this as an explanation for why he felt it was justified to destroy a building um, because he had designed it on the condition that it be built exactly as designed. And lots of bureaucratic intermediaries had violated that contract and it was built according to, it was built with some details and some structural parts differently. And he, as the creator, destroyed it. And he gives, gives this speech and the jury buys it very rapidly and they nullify. That is to say, they find him innocent, find him not guilty of a crime to which he is actually convinced and where all the facts indicate without a doubt that he is guilty. Uh, and they do it because of this one word, conscience, which I'm gonna come back to repeatedly in the talk. But let me just tell you about what it means for a jury to nullify a law, uh, right? Jurors, juries have two kinds of authority, two kinds of power. They have the power to find the facts, which is to say, you know, did the guy do it? If it's a he said, said she said case, which one of them is telling the truth? That's just the empirical question of the facts. And most jurors believe that's all they have the power to do. But they also have this power to say, well, I don't care about the law, you know, but it's a bad law. And I'm going to say what I want to say about this case from my conscience. Um, and I don't care what these other legislators and things have written in statute, it doesn't matter, right? So that's the power to set aside the law. And that goes back to the origin of juries 
in the Anglo-American system, which starts with the Magna Carta in 1215 um, and became very important in the history of the United States right around the 1750s, 1760s, when in this part of the country, juries were nullifying just about every case that came up, uh, every case that was a smuggling or anti-tax case, and every case that it was an anti-Crown, anti-British uh, uh, sedition case, right? And so it was nullification that actually led to the kind of social license for revolution or secession or subtle revolt or whatever you want to call what happened beginning in 1776, right? And in a criminal trial, which sedition and smuggling and trespass was a criminal, not civil matters, right? Um, a guilty, a not guilty verdict is final. There's no appeal. The state, having brought a case, cannot uh, try again when the jury has said not guilty. If the, if the jury says guilty, the defendant can appeal that up quite far. But a not guilty verdict just ends the process and the defendant goes free, right? And even if it's a hung jury, very often the state and state prosecutor doesn't want to try again, especially if it's a kind of high profile case, it's embarrassing. So often in a hung jury, a hung jury is just remember where one juror says not guilty because there has to be absolute unanimity for a guilty verdict. Of course, there doesn't have to be unanimity at all for a hung jury, right? So um, I would say that this is, and I'll, I'll go into this, I go into this more in the Boston Review piece and I can talk about the, the risks and benefits of this in the uh, question and answer. But this is the kind of hidden legislature that is out there that actually is represents a redress against the Senate and the Congress and their state equivalents and all the other elected legislators that we have. We also have that, that make laws. We also have a randomly selected legislature that can unmake laws. And this is extremely important when we think about the political economy of fossil fuels and where it is possible to actually make ground in fighting against fossil fuel institutions. Uh, okay, so um, what Rand imagined happening um, in, or in, in this courtroom in 1943 or so in New York, um, but actually you know, kind of almost happened in this New Hampshire courtroom um, in 2002. This is Judge Shulman. This is Logan Perkins uh, there who's arguing for the defense. And so again, defending those five people against charges of trespass on the bridge, the rail bridge in Hooksett, New Hampshire. She, so she's speaking to the jury and she says, we invite you, she's imploring the jury, we invite you to put your conscience into practice and find my clients not guilty. And then she gets historical. When the founding settlers here decided they no longer wanted to be ruled by a king, they decided they wanted to be judged by their peers. That is the jury's historical role, to be the conscience of the community. And then finally she ended, even if you find that the evidence is sufficient, you are not required to bring a guilty verdict. Shulman is meanwhile shifting in his chair and getting anxious, <laughs> right? And so, and, and, and so he says at one point, we are not here to resolve climate change. We must follow the law. So it's a little bit of a tussle. And um, there's this, this tussle is historically grounded in, uh, in New Hampshire. So, but let me just tell you what Shulman said, because after these various speeches, uh, closing remarks, Shulman, the judge, gives his jury instructions. And he says this, this is standard text. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more of the elements of the offense charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. On the other hand, if you find that the state has proven all the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you may find the defendant guilty. You see the difference between those two sentences? How many people caught the difference? Yeah, Don caught the difference. <laughs> yeah. So, right, may, may here, must there, all right? So this is the signal that the jury may nullify uh, in giving a not guilty verdict. 
right? That's of course a very subtle uh, signal, and the judge didn't didn't add any <coughs> to any of this. And unfortunately, I think most of the jury probably didn't didn't actually notice. Okay, there are other ways of doing this. Here are some instructions from 2021, where uh, James O'Neill uh, is Judge James O'Neill was trying a marijuana grower, and he said. Even if you find that the state has proven each and every element of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, you may still find the defendant not guilty if you have a conscientious feeling that a not guilty verdict would be a fair result in this case. Of course, it's a, it's a sentence I would never write, too many clauses and all this, but run on sentence, but it conveys that potential to nullify more directly than Judge Shulman, right? And, you know, there's, there, as I said, there's a bit of a history. This comes from 2021 in 2012, that comes, sorry, that comes from 2011. In 2012, the Republican legisl legislature, correction, 2011, the Republican legislature passed a law permitting defense attorneys to inform juries of this power, right? That's the only state in the country that would permit defense attorneys to explicitly state the power of nullification. However, then the New Hampshire Supreme Court overturned that law, uh, which, is, which is why it's now not uh, entirely legal for defense attorneys to state the power of nullification. But between 2014 and 2012, the House in New Hampshire considered five of these pro-nullification bills. They've been voted down. Then in 2017 and 2018, the House passed two more bills in favor of the nullification instructions but the Senate has rejected them. So, and my, I, my information may not be fully up to date because this thing is always under scrutiny, but basically there is a lively debate about nullification in these circles in New Hampshire, more so than in any other state, um, with support for nullification from a pretty broad spectrum. Okay, so the reason that's relevant is that I'm gonna turn to libertarians now. Um, and I don't want you to think about the Libertarian Party uh, when I talk about Libertarians, because having hung out with Libertarians, I now realize that any Libertarian who is elected to office and serves is in a way betraying the cause and involves herself then in ceaseless contradictions. Uh, and so that's actually a minority of Libertarians who would ever do that. And the majority of Libertarians stays pretty far away from elected offices, may not vote at all, and doesn't identify with any particular party. Um, so that I think actually the strength of libertarianism in New Hampshire may be more measured in the existence of a nullification debate. That may be actually the best measure of libertarian strength here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and of course, very few of them would actually just call themselves libertarians. There are voluntarists, there are minarchists, they're anarcho-capitalists, they're anarcho-Christians, uh, Christian capitalists. Um, but one of the unifying principles is the idea of non-aggression, which comes from Murray Rothbard. Uh, and his, his wrote a lot of books, probably the most accessible uh, libertarian thinker. Um, and I'm drawing from For a New Liberty uh, from 1973. So basically, to be a libertarian, you just basically have to believe this. No man or, again, gendered language, but anyway, no man or group of men may aggress against the person or property of anyone else. And everything else is permitted. This is the one prohibition in a libertarian worldview. And so taxation is a form of aggression against the property of another. And the pro property and personhood are very closely tied in this case. Um, this is not really a sophisticated theory of property as a bundle of rights uh, and relating among people. This is like property as my stuff. Don't mess with my stuff and don't try to tax my stuff. Um, so, and one of the exponents of it from Keene uh, is Ian Freeman, uh, who runs a, free, runs a radio show. I can't remember the name of the radio show, but you can listen to him three hours a day, every day, <laughs> if you want to. And, and, and the other folks in the Free Keene group um, he cut his teeth actually in Florida in the early 2000s, doing outreach uh, for in, in uh, outreach outside courthouses for this group, 
the fully informed jury association. Uh, they like to hand flyers to jurors walking in for jury selection. It's not jury tampering because those people have not yet been admitted into a jury. They're just like members of the public coming in for the first round of selection. And the pamphlet says, well, you should nullify. And if there's been no victim, um, then you should certainly nullify and you can nullify for any reason you like and never don't send anybody to jail and that kind of thing. Um, so he moved to Keene in 2006 and he adapted that message to New Hampshire uh, for this organization, the New Hampshire jury, the nhjury.com. Um, and, and, and these leaflets talk, talk a lot about the right to conscience, which is actually written into the state constitution. So from Freeman and other libertarians, I wanted to accept, to assess the chances that those hook set defendants, the five who blocked the bridge, might get an acquittal or a hung jury. What, what were their chances of getting a hung jury if we were to kind of replay the case for Randians and Roth parties? Now, it, it, in, in, a sense, in a sense that this is, this is, you might say from the outset, this is fairly hopeless um, because libertarians don't believe in climate change. They, they utterly dispute that science. Um, remember, libertarians oppose, I should have mentioned this, or it's kind of obvious, they, they oppose the state. Um, if you are a state-funded climate scientist, like David, state-funded climate scientist, right? No? No, scientist. Oh, well, whatever. We didn't have a state-funded. Okay, okay. You're anyway, state funded. One, I'm a state-funded uh, climate scholar from <laughs> Rutgers University. So they are not going to believe what I have to say because I'm contaminated by government, right? And in any case, I think libertarians are actually an interesting, interesting, humble approach to prediction, maybe a self-serving approach to prediction, but they believe that the future is not written and the future is wide open to human freedom. And therefore, all the climate models and incidentally, the pandemic models more recently all of these models are to be automatically distrusted because anybody who predicts the future is putting himself in a godlike position of authority over others. And if you're a lover of freedom, you would not accept that. All right. So as I said, difficult. It's not, I'm not going to persuade, I'm not going to persuade these people that climate change is happening or real or will happen or anything. So we got to give, got to agree to disagree on that. And the other problem with persuading the libertarian juror here. Uh, is that, you know, they take trespassing very seriously, right? Yeah. Like, you know, the, the, the train bridge and the train tracks and the train and the coal and the coal plant are all private property. And here these climate activists went and mucked around with that and that's aggression and that should not be allowed. So my conversations with people, they'd say, you know, don't try to, don't try to convince me of this. I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm a private property absolutist. So with Ian, I, I, started, I said, well, okay, okay, but let's look at Pan Am Railways. Um, how private is that, right? I mean, it uh, resulted from a bankruptcy of the BNM Railroad, went to chapter 11 in federal court and got bailed out by the feds. So Ian finishes my thought in this conversation. The railways are basically the state, he says, okay. And it's a pretty straight libertarian argument. So he agreed with me very quickly. And then his roommate said, that is straight up Atlas Shrugged shit. <laughs> Atlas Shrugged is Ayn Rand's other big famous novel. So, but you know, that was almost too easy. Uh, and that was keen. And keen, the libertarians are not quite as hardcore as you go over to Manchester and you're getting into really hot territory. So I'm at this crypto themed meetup. The other thing is for individualists, libertarians are very social. It's all on the basis of consent. And so they have meetups all the time. You can go four days a week in this state to libertarian meetups and you can pay in Bitcoin or in the, I didn't bring one, in the, the gold back. Uh, these, are, these are bills that have 1,000th of an ounce of gold. Um, so there I am in Manchester. I meet Sandra. And um, I'll, I'll tell you about this conversation. So, I go through the whole thing with her and we do a detour through Facebook and other platforms, which in, in this 427 thing are some rules that I don't quite understand having to do with pipelines and so forth. The, all those platforms have also 
been government protected and government supported. And so she finally says, so railways are almost a subsidy of government. And I'm all about fuck the government, is what she said. So if you're the defense attorney, Sandra says, and you presented it that way, I have to vote them not guilty. Well, she meant, you know, as a juror, vote them not guilty. So let's think about this. What does she mean by a subsidy of government? This is where we have to go back to Rothbard's principle here. Um, what does of anyone else mean? It means of people. So, and the classic libertarian, the classic anarcho-capitalist unit of analysis is the small business run by a family or by a man who sets up a store or something or a little manufacturing shop or something or other and is running this business. And if things go wrong, well, they go out of business, right? And then what has happened in the United States, of course, is that little small business incorporates itself and it gets limited liability, which is an immunity from responsibility granted by government, right? So it's a, it's, it's a form of subsidy, uh, not <clears throat> subsidy in money, but subsidy in risk protection, which is an immunity, right? And so what, uh, what libertarians who think about this, including Rothbard will say, is that that corporation does not have personhood. This is a principle that the left would embrace as well. So that to you may possibly aggress within libertarian principles against a corporation because a corporation is not that different from government. And of course, aggression against government, well, that's fine. That's what, that's, that's what it's all about, right? That's what, that's what rebellion is about. Um, so I'll tell you about one final libertarian. Um, oh, here, gotta go back. So Alu Axelman, it's his, Elliot Axelman, if you wanna look him up, but he goes by Alu. This is his latest book. He lives in Hookset. You could throw a stone from his house to these train tracks. He uh, runs a group called Liberty Block, tremendously prolific guy. Um, and so I get into a discussion about this question of acqu acquitting those five who blocked the train track. You know, could you do it as a libertarian? So, and we go through, go through the history of the Pan Am Railways, and he says, well, almost everything is on a spectrum of private to government. And so we dig into the same details. And then he says, talk to the lawyers, he says, and explain my spectrum argument. Uh, that's Alu's, I thought it was my spectrum argument, but Alu says it was his spectrum argument. And then in fact, just in corresponding with him in the run up to this talk, I realized he thought of it first. So he wrote this essay in 2021. So it's a little essay, which you can Google, but the, the, uh, the slides, the, the image sums up everything you need to know. So here is the United States and the Soviet Union, socialist countries, because they have mixed government with business, exercising authority through the IRS over, oh, and here's a defense contractor. So this is socialism <laughs> over here, right? And what it's doing is absorbing all of these private businesses, which includes some of the tech firms and ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is on the board of this Irving Institute. So you can ask the board member whether she accepts responsibility for that. But basically saying that there is a military fossil fuel government complex here um, as an almost seamless web. Okay, so sitting on the railroad tracks owned by this partnership is not aggression against private property. There's nothing private about this. It's all government. I should say libertarians don't like to use the word public. Uh, they use the word government, right? So this is all government in one way or another. So he said, sure, I'll quit. I'll quit if somebody trespasses against, which is not trespassing anymore, if somebody walks onto train tracks, which have been in any way linked to tax money extracted from the people, then the people have a right to walk back onto it and occupy it, right? Um, and then he says, 
as a progressive, he saw my Bernie bumper sticker, so he sussed me out pretty quickly. I'm trying to go a little bit incognito as an anthropologist, but you have to be careful where you park when you do that. Um, as a progressive, he says, maybe you should go suggest the libertarian argument to the activists. So that's exactly what I intended to do, um, but you got to do it right. So this is the this is the tricky part. This is like second half of the talk. How can I best suggest the libertarian argument to climate activists in a way that will be heard? Because people on the left call libertarians fascists, which to libertarians sounds quite absurd because fascists are very pro-state, they're state authoritarians, and libertarians are anti-state anarchists. So there's a huge amount of misunderstanding here that I don't really think I can bridge in the time that, that we need to, in order to shut down fossil fuels, we need to do that quite immediately on an emergency basis. And I can, can't be like Murray Rothbard and spend 30 years writing books about this. So I'm gonna try to use Henry David Thoreau as a shortcut. Um, he is the, a local hero around Concord and Manchester. Um, and I should just bri briefly mention naturalist and political writer lived from born lived a short life from 1817 to 1862. He's a triple hero in fact he's this local hero um, uh, partly because um, in 18 and in, sorry 1839 he published a week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers which documents this canoe trip he took with his brother a few years before that where they biked uh, them bikes they, they canoed up to Hookset, in fact, right where the bridge now is. And they parked their canoes in a place where somebody would like to now put a restaurant and walked up a little bit inland to this little hill called the Pinnacle and then walked back and kayaked, uh, canoed downstream. Okay, so local hero in the jury pool. Also a hero to libertarians. This is the institute named after Ludwig von Mises who's a libertarian economist I wouldn't recommend to you much harder to get through than Rothbard. Um, and that is not because he canoed on the Merrimack River or anything, and not because of Walden Pond, uh, but because of his essay on civil disobedience, which is in fact where the word comes from in 1849, and another essay called Slavery in Massachusetts in 1850, uh, 1854, both of them recommending unlawful ways of violating the law uh, for, for political purposes, right? And he's also the hero of one of the Hookset defendants. Um, Jay O'Hara, one of the five arrested on the bridge, had done another action on the water in 2013 by Brayton Point in Massachusetts, southeastern Massachusetts. And if you can see on the back, so what they did was he and another guy called Ken Ward went out there in front of a coal barge and stuck their lobster boat here and blocked the coal barge for about half a day. Can you see what it says on the back of the lobster boat? <laughs> this is a little bit closer. The Henry David T. lobster boat. This is the two of them. Jay uh, uh, O'Hara is the one kneeling. And so actually Brayton Point shut down a few years after, not long, actually less than a year after the trial, I think, um, partly because of the negative publicity, because of the economic uh, constraints on coal these days. So this action contributed, this is actually, this is in my, in my view, the most successful anti-fossil fuel action anywhere because it contributed to shutting down not new infrastructure, like all the, all the fights you hear, we hear about now, Dapple, Keystone, XL, Line 3, those are all new infrastructure, <laughs> which of course we have to shut down. But we also have to shut down all the infrastructure that exists, and that's what he did. And that if, if successful, that's what would happen in Bow, New Hampshire as well. So, so, so you know, to get back to the trial, uh, Jay O'Hara, the guy in the foreground here, had actually told me, he told me afterwards, a couple of people told me afterwards, he had considered quoting Thoreau in his closing statement. And he, he, he wanted to use Thoreau to talk about the power of conscience, again from that essay on civil disobedience. Uh, but at the last minute, in the night before, with all the defendants and the council, they decided not to go with Thoreau. They rejected Thoreau and they substituted in Martin Luther King 
with a quotation from, from his essay, a uh, letter from a Birmingham gym from 1963. Uh, and the reason they did this, oh, and he was also gonna mention Thoreau, I mean, Jay was also gonna mention the Boston Tea Party and connect this all, but uh, they had a generative conversation, they said, and decided not to glorify white colonizers. So they threw Thoreau out, veered over towards Martin Luther King, and gave some very useful words that just, just as relevant, maybe more relevant to the action of civil disobedience, um, and then went before the judge. So he gave that speech before the judge. So when he sentenced the four defendants, remember the one got off for, uh, for just being the liaison and all, but he sentenced Jay O'Hare and the other four. He, um, this whole, this whole question of identity and history was extremely relevant. So what Schulman said is, I disagree with you, but I am of you. Jay O'Hara is a Quaker and went to a Quaker college. Uh, this came out in his, in, in the testimony. Judge Schulman is a Quaker and went to uh, Haverford, also a Quaker college. Schulman explained that the civil rights hero, John Lewis, is one of Schulman's heroes. But then he said in reference to civil rights, the civil rights movement, let's not be anachronistic. The bridge in Hook set wasn't the Pettus Bridge in Selma. This was a case, he said, folks, of civil disobedience for the remarkably privileged. And although J. O'Hara lives on $30,000 a year in salary as a sale maker in Maine, he still is, was associated with privilege. And basically, Schulman rejected all of this association with Martin Luther King and with the civil rights movement. And as I said, I sentenced them all. They had been found guilty at that point, sentenced them to uh, two years of suspended jail time uh, and five years of parole, which prevents any activities, any further activities around civil disobedience on their part. So my speculation this is, again, speculative anthropology. My speculation is that if J. O'Hara and the others had identified with Thoreau and with this entire history of civil disobedience in New England, in a libertarian sense of individual conscience, they would have had an easier time of it and maybe gotten a hung jury, um, which would have meant not being sentenced. Even if they had been convicted, they might have been more persuasive with Judge Shulman um, because of rooting it in Thoreau, who is the bridge between hooks, the hook set region, regional history, between regional history, between libertarian ideology and climate goals. Okay. So I'm, I'm nearing the end here. What I'm suggesting then is an alliance on the basis of Thoreau or something similar, on the basis of individual rights, on the basis of anti-state tendencies between libertarians and climate activists. Um, in fact, let me say that alliance is too strong a word from what I'm suggesting. Um, you know, we have alliances in, in politics, the climate movement and the global climate movement and the environmental justice, local environmental justice movement. Are, are working towards and made quite some progress towards very useful alliances in the US. I'm not actually talking about that kind of alliance. Um, that's an alliance of ends, where both sides have the desire to shut down the fossil fuel industry at various scales. With libertarians, I think there's more likelihood to have an alliance of means, right? So, Libertarians don't want to shut down. They certainly don't want government to shut down any industry. Um, and as I've said, they don't accept that climate change is a problem at all. Um, but they do want nullification. And for libertarians, nullification is a kind of prefigurative act. So when I, when I say, when I talk about prefigurative politics, I mean that you achieve part of the goal immediately by doing the thing. So you undermine the power of judges, the power of the state judiciary immediately by nullifying a law. 
And I'll tell you, libertarians in, in, in New Hampshire, especially in the keen folks, they love prefigurative politics. Like one of the things that's gotten Ian Freeman into trouble is that he and his friends for a period, they would there'd be the, the state worker who collects money from parking meters. And they would walk a few feet ahead of that person, putting a quarter in each of the meters that said <laughs> violation, just in order to fuck with the state, right? So that's great. Um, and nullification is one way of fucking with the state. And it prefigures a world where laws don't actually carry force. Okay? So that's the, that's the alliance. That's the alliance of means for libertarians. For climate activists, of course, what, what uh, getting a, a, an acquittal, getting a nullification and an acquittal on a train blockage what that does is lower the penalty for civil disobedience. And one precedent leads to another precedent. And so if we could get to a situation where blocking a train or a pipeline or a plant carried no legal penalty in a fairly reliable way, then many more people would be willing to do that, right? And then we might actually have a direct action sort of mass movement against fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and the reason I think, why do I, why do I think this is necessary? This sounds, this sounds fairly extreme, and there are a great deal of risks to nullifying laws, which I'll go into in question and answer if you like. Um, so this is, this is necessary, I think, or it's necessary at least to think about this, because the climate movement is pretty well stymied at the legislative level, federally, and in most states where fossil fuels are produced, right? And there are long and complex reasons for that having to do with the fact that our democracy tends to represent places as much as it represents people, and that places there have a veto power over what people do so that Alaska has two senators while California has two senators. And it's going to be difficult to stop something like the Willow Project with the kind of senatorial representation that fossil fuel states have. And we have a constitution that is so locked in stone that we can't actually fix it. And we, and if you want to talk about overthrowing the state, I don't think that's very likely to succeed. If you want to talk about an ecological dictatorship, I think the dictatorship will likely get will be Trump and he is not an environmentalist. So I don't see a legislative way to shut down fossil fuels fast enough, right? And so I thought for a while that, oh, well, democracy is not, our form of democracy has no solution. But then I discovered there's this whole other law making or actually law unmaking body out there, which is the jury in every courtroom, right? And so it actually follows in a, in a way rooted in democracy slightly before our constitution, but rooted in US democracy to um, render fossil fuel unprotectable through this kind of nullification. As I said, rooted going all the way back to the Magna Carta. And so this is the part that a lot of people think is very off the wall. What's the precedent for this? What is the precedent for civil disobedience causing a rapid political shift as dramatic as shutting down fossil fuels would be? There is one precedent, and it is the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And, and that happened, well, what I realized in talking to people about this is that in the US, people who lived through this didn't really understand it as a popular victory because I think the US media um, portrayed this as kind of the fruition of Reagan shouting to Gorbachev, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev. And it was a form of US and capitalist triumphalism that this happened at all. I, I happened to be living in Zimbabwe with a German at the time. So I saw things from a different perspective and, and, you know, and learned and later read up that, you know, there were popular protests in Dresden for weeks, all illegal. And where the police, we're refusing to shut the demonstrations down, also unlawful. So what involved, what, what emerged in Dresden was a sort of collaboration between um, civil disobedience on the part of protesters and civil disobedience on the part of the enforcers. 
without actually, you know, shaking hands over this or making without an alliance, um, but nonetheless, a congruence of action, right? And, and then all it took was for this to come over to Berlin, and you had the same protesters and you had normal East Berliners, and then you had border guards who didn't shoot people. And they sort of deliberately garbled orders and they kind of ignored stuff. And there was a lot of uncertainty and bizarreness in one night. And then people just started crossing over. And then like it was, you know, 10 and then 100 and then 10,000. And then the whole state fell in a couple of weeks, right? So that is the most rapid, uh, nonviolent political, most rapid and total nonviolent political change I think that's ever happened in the era of modern states. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm overlooking one or two revolutions, but this is pretty dramatic. Um, so that, and it's bizarre that we don't learn from this. Like the classic book on this is Chenoweth's, what's your name of Chenoweth, something. The, the, the classic canon of civil disobedience in the United States doesn't say anything about Berlin in 1989. Because again, I think it's remembered as capitalist triumphalism and what could the West possibly learn from that? Or what could the left possibly learn from that? Um, so I think the situation, I'm wrapping up here, I think the situation in uh, that we face now with respect to the conditions for life on planet Earth is dire enough. I don't like to use the word climate because that sort of undersells what's at stake. You know, it's not about climate, it's not like about uh, an aggregation of weather. It's about which species and which, which communities, human and non-human, get to survive. So this is what's at stake. And it's an era where the risks are enormous and they become certainties if we delay. And ecological risks are enormous. And so the political risks, I think, have to match that. In other words, we have to come up, not just as AOC says, with a, a solution at the scale of the crisis. We have to come up with a solution as risky as the crisis. And so jury nullification is a risky solution but the alternative of uh, the alternatives in terms of political mobilization and action are clearly not working. So, um, and, and I think the final point is that this, um, what I'm trying to articulate here when I said the whisper of this, this new broader uh, alliance of libertarians and climate activists is I'm, try, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm trying to find a center. Um, maybe there's a, there's a radical centrist uh, approach here, but, um, but you know, it's not the sort of thing where people say, oh, well, the Trump supporters and the Biden supporters just need to talk about their grandkids with each other. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that is about political doctrine. This is not anti-ideological. This is not about, you know, everybody uniting over apple pie. This is about certain political groups, which are fairly small, but strategically placed, you, in, in certain jury pools where fossil fuel infrastructure is uniting over dogma and understanding that dogma from all sides and seeing where they coincide. So um, unlikely bedfellows, we have to accept it. And we have desperate circumstances which demand an, an, an agreement among, not agreement, a congruence among unlikely bedfellows. And I'm recommending this as a last resort which is where we're at, of the climate movement. Thank you. Questions, concerns, queries? Ah, yeah, yeah. Laura. Thank you. Uh, I, not, I, I did not know about the potential of jury nullification as a way to get ourselves out of this pickle. Well, what I'm worried about is like, do we need, do we, I say we as a general, as a general align with the libertarians just to convince people to nullify the juries? Yes. Like, I'm like, why do we need that? Because I think there's a lot of history of even the rest of the world of not following laws, right? So like, why would that Right. So, like, why would this one domain, the jury box, be one where we can be like, okay, guess what? In this place, we can. That part, I want to keep on 
I see. So you're saying that we may not, we might not actually need libertarians. There might be a broader. I mean, I, I live in Vermont, thing. so I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Obviously, like, like as much, like you see, but it would be quite easy to convince my neighbors to vote against jurors. Um, but, so I just that part. Like, why do we need this? Because like, it's a lot of political ideological machinations that maybe those people would use to get them to get these two to align. Yeah, I mean, that's more hopeful. You know, there's a section in the Boston Review article where I talk about uh, divestment movements. Mm -hmm. And when Bill McKibben laid out in that Rolling Stone article in about 2014, laid out the justification for a divestment, fossil fuel divestment movement in the US. He, he was trying to reiterate what happened with divestment from South Africa in the 1980s and talked about it as the removal of the social license to operate. Yeah. And I talked with him about this when I was writing on because what do you mean by that? Social license to operate. And he said, well, that means, you know, whether they're going to have, whether those farms are going to maintain their credibility with their lobbyists in Congress and everything and all this. And that's not actually what the phrase historically meant. The phrase actually comes from the mining sector, which in the 80s and 90s was facing sabotage, not just by investment, but sabotage of operations in, um, in Indonesia, New Guinea, Ecuador, Colombia. Um, and they said, oh my God, we have a problem. We have no social license to operate. It's obvious because people are you know, slashing the tires of our trucks and things. And I, my suspicion is that people in the oil industry were kind of relieved when they realized that losing your social license to operate just means that you don't get money from people, right? So what the, the test would be find a place where um, a, a divestment movement has been successful and see if people on a jury pool sympathetic with that action are, you know, could, could, have, could consider fossil fuels to be so illegitimate that trespass would be justified. I mean, I think that I, I, if, we, if it were the 60s and 70s, I think you'd have a stronger case to make about liberals because there, there were, there were nullification cases for draft resistors and, and people who busted into draft offices and did some vandalism and so on there. And that was an era of, of resistance to the state so maybe maybe liberals are prepared to resist the statement as well. I'm, I'm waiting on this question about abortion. So yes, so that that's the next frontier for nullification, even more even more pressing than this one. Yeah, David. Um, great talk. Um, so I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've been talking in one of my classes a lot about how to blow a pipeline by Andres mm -hmm. Malm, which obviously has some uh, relevance to to this. Um, but I think right there's a, a very different diagnosis of why civil un, uh, disobedience isn't happening in the climate movement. And his argument, right, is that it's not happening less because of concern about punishment, because of strategy. And Bill McKibben, right, as a leader here of saying, like, this is a strictly nonviolent movement and the extension of, you know, property and personhood in the ways that these are, are commingled in the U.S. tradition. And so that, um, Doing trespass, right, is, is seen like as a, an infringement on a person's body in the US legal system. And, and so, you know, McKibben et al., right, aren't saying don't do civil disobedience in this way because you'll be punished, but don't do it because it's going to get backlash, right, to the to, um, to this movement. And so I guess one question is: to what extent is civil disobedience not happening because activists are worried about going to jail? And how much of it is because of these property relations and the way the property is understood, um, which then, of course, like even if it's an alliance of means with the libertarians, like we're still reifying right these, these property relations. So, I guess to what extent, like you know, is do you see civil disobedience not happening because of concerns about convictions, which is partially, I mean, the two examples of blowing up a pipeline that you know exist in you know two women who blew up a pipeline in, in the U.S. I mean, we're charged with terrorism and went to prison for quite some time, which mm -hmm. is right, a motivation to not blow like mine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I guess to what extent like does even nullification right address you know McKibben's argument of or um, McKibben's argument that like on a practical scale like that will lose you know public support 
or is it at a point that maybe we don't have to be, we should be less concerned about public support? We should be less concerned about public support. So let me, let me, let me tell you, this is, this is sort of, a, I should have given this as a background. So, you know, Andreas Mouth totally recommend his book. It's got the wrong title. It's not really how to blow up a pipeline. Yeah, there's no other, other things you can get on the dark web that will tell you that. It's more about why to blow up a pipeline, the justification for it. And he faults uh, McKibben and 350.org and just about every climate organization you've heard of for being too law-abiding. And he says, you know, given the level of danger and emergency, it's astonishing how restrained and unstrategically restrained the climate movement has been. And so a guy called Daniel Sherrill wrote a rebuttal to this. Uh, I mean, Mal wrote a smaller essay of it in the nation and Sherrill wrote a rebuttal. And Cheryl basically says to Mal, look, you're right, you're totally right about everything, but if we start trespassing too much, especially if we start sabotaging things, people will call us terrorists and we will lose the popular support that we've built, we'll lose the support in Congress and we'll be screwed. And so the thought experiment I'm doing here is to say, forget about Congress and forget about the media, right? Because when you're doing direct action in prefigurative politics, you don't actually care. Your, your theory of change no longer depends on the media and upon legislation, right? And then I sort of lay out a theory of change, which depends on a different legislative body, which is the jury, lots of juries, right? And so those are the allies that matter because they're the allies that actually move the social license to operate in this functional way and make fossil fuels unprotectable. So you're right, David, the whole, whole the public might, might, might be outraged at eco-sabotage and so on. That maybe doesn't matter, right? Um, there's another point on that, I'm gonna say. Uh, but I'll come back to it. Yeah, maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter as much if you're actually doing the work and getting away with it in shutting down fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, Chris. Um, thanks, David, that's really interesting. Um, two questions, the one is probably, the first one is probably kind of unfair. Um, when I say, I, I'm thinking globally, um, not every place in the world has jury systems like the United States or has climate activists in a similar way or has libertarians. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I'm, I'm sure they exist in Canada, but who knows? Um, and so I kept, for some reason I kept, and I read it read it a while ago and my memory is always failing me these days, but I think about Tim Mitchell's carbon democracy when these you know, efforts sort of to bring labor into this equation, there were this series of, right, you know, work stoppages in the, the tw throughout the 20th century where at the point of production, things kind of got, you know, there was a, a wrench put into this, and maybe literally in some cases. Um, so is there anything to take away, connect your argument to Mitchell's and sort of that whole realm of urban carbon democracy? Um, the second question is, uh, I'm assuming not all climate activists are in the same and operate in a similar way. And I kept, the, so I'd be really curious if libertarians are looking to um, the unceded territories movement, the take back the land movement, so sort of indigenous, not even climate activists, I would let them call them themselves what they want, earth activists, um, so to speak. Is there any, is that part of the alliance or could it be? Because they're fairly anti-state in yes. many respects. Um, well, let me say, I probably use the word alliance in, in too many different senses. So uh, well, you're asking questions about different alliances, which I'm saying are less relevant. Those alliances are less relevant and useful than we think. So the first one about the alliance between the labor movement and the climate movement, which I'm very involved in through the American Federation of Teachers, um, and what Timothy Mitchell says is that, yeah, phenomenal situation in you know, 20th century uh, Britain where you have coal moving along by trains and trucks and ships and so forth. There are lots of bottlenecks where a strike, a work stoppage can prevent it, and you can then win labor demands. And those, those labor demands have nothing to do with the environment, incidentally. And the stoppages were not intended to be permanent at all. Um, so I don't think it's actually a good model for making environmental demands. Um, and so, yeah, so what, in, in, in moving toward that fraction of the climate movement that moved towards, moves towards shutting down infrastructure, civil disobedience, 
sabotage, probably ruptures any alliance with the, any, any alliance, which is very small anyway, with the labor movement. There's a whole other thing, by the way, I'm trying to develop with the Labor Network for Sustainability that involves a, a, a plan to shift the entire fossil fuel sector workers into the job of dismantling stuff and capping and monitoring and shutting down, which is a, a generation of really good fossil fuel jobs involved in shutting down fossil fuel, which very few people are talking about. Like I have green jobs, I've written green jobs don't really exist. A green job like wind farms, solar farms, that's a very flash in the pan construction job someplace where fossil fuel workers don't live. But where fossil fuel workers do live, there's a great proposal for this. They the, use the word abandonment, but it's actually a very labor intensive thing to properly abandon an oil well. Right? But that's for a different fraction of the climate movement than what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about today is a fraction of the climate movement that ruptures all of its alliances, which aren't helping very much, and says we are going to have, and I need to find a better word for this because it's not an alliance, but we are going to have a, uh, a, a congruence of means with libertarians or with liberals who go for it. Um, so on the question, so on the question of indigenous people, um, yeah, I talked about this a bit with some libertarians. Um, indigenous people are not anti-state in the way libertarians are anti-state. Um, and it gets down to property questions because libertarians very much identify with homesteading and with the idea of moving to some frontier of supposedly empty land as a white man and planting your seeds and your fence and occupying it. And if you press them and say, well, that wasn't really empty land and you sort of stole it, the homesteaders stole it from somebody, wasn't that an act of aggression? Then you get them into a cul-de-sac, at least in these conversations, that they can't really exit from. So maybe you could say, I've won the argument, but winning an argument is not the basis of an alliance, actually. <laughs> Agreement is the basis of um, an alliance. So I think that's kind of a non-starter. It's sort of like libertarians don't believe in climate change. They also don't really believe in colonialism. But, yeah, Tom. Professor Hughes, thank you so much for coming here. I, I just want to say first that there's something cosmically appropriate about you delivering this particular lecture at this particular <laughs> institution. Because after all, we are sitting at Dartmouth College, not Dartmouth University. Dartmouth University was the state institution that came in and took over Dartmouth College during the Jefferson administration and was thrown the hell out by uh, the US Supreme Court in 1819 as a result of the Dartmouth College versus uh, Woodward case. So it, huh. it's great that you're here and it's yeah, all a okay. uh, piece. I have to say, though, that I'm not convinced. Even though you have, for the first time, laid out a coherent theory that I can understand about why civil disobedience happens at a place like Merrimack Station, I guess what I would say in response to that is Merrimack Station doesn't matter. It is sitting idle almost all of the time. It is not keeping the lights on. I think that if you, not you personally, or maybe you personally, but if uh, climate activists who are into civil disobedience started laying siege to places that really matter, they'd never get in front of a jury because they would be dead. The government would kill them on site. That's my uh, So that's your speculative. <laughs> Not <laughs> wrong there. Um, let me let me put. A, I, I like what you're saying about Merrimack. Could quite possibly true. Yes, is that you? You a, 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 a harder target would send a stronger signal but there is a middle position between your, your 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 lethal fatalism there and what i'm saying which is that yes the state if, if civil disobedience really and if this is already starting to happen civil disobedience gets traction and the state ramps up the penalties so what they said to the five defendants was it's a remarkable parole that they are not supposed to in what is the word for it? They're not supposed to come anywhere near railroad tracks for five years unless they're <laughs> riding a train and doing it at a station, or unless they're driving a car over the tracks very fast, right? So it's 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 telling them where they can't go 
And also they're not supposed to be even in meetings discussing civil disobedience for five years. So this is arguably a restriction on the freedom of assembly, the right of assembly and the right of speech. And so this is maybe a good thing because what civil disobedience is doing is pushing the state into violating constitutional rights and take it a step further, we're violating constitutional rights in more visible ways. And Utah has just is considering legislation which would make protests against fossil fuel infrastructure uh, a form of terrorism. Now, if the state starts calling the exercise of your constitutional rights terrorism, the good news is that you have a lot of jurors who aren't gonna like that at all. And certainly liberals, not just libertarians, are not gonna want to send somebody to jail for going to a demonstration, right? Even if that demonstration involves sitting down in front of some railroad tracks somewhere, they're not gonna wanna send that person to jail for 20 years as a terrorist. And they're not gonna accept that it's anything like, you know, bombing the Twin Towers in New York, not equivalent crimes. So if we provoke, if the civil, the civil disobedience provoke the state into repression through courts anyway, then, and juries still exist, then we actually have the circumstances for really widespread nullification by a lot of people. Now, of course, if the state, if we provoke the state too far and they start shooting people, then that's a different story. Well, maybe not. I mean, you've got, uh, if, if you take the example of Kent State, um, mm -hmm. when they went, like, I, I, went to, I went to high school as a conservative kid li listening to Merle Haggard sing Oki from the Scobie. And when they killed those four kids at Kent State, I was out on the street to Greenfield. Mm -hmm. um, so so maybe Don, maybe well, Don. It's not so I mean, crazy after all. I don't want any of my friends to get killed over this. Right, kind of right. But yeah, you're right, you're right. Sorry, sorry. Marin had her hand up. It's, it's on a different topic. So. Oh. Well, I, I just wanted to say, first of all, it was really fun to listen to you. But, um, second, that, that what I worry about with what you said is that no precedent gets created by jury nullification. Um, so, so it's just got to be a hundred thousand acts of conscience that uh, that somehow have a snowball effect if that works. And, and I'm wondering if if uh, uh, one way to get the, the, get the folks from the from the free state movement on our side is to is to go after the subsidies. Now that you, we don't really need subsidies anymore for solar and wind power. So now let's take them away from everybody else, and uh, and maybe maybe that will have a dramatic effect. Mm. This is what libertarians say. They said they would like to remove fossil fuel subsidies and the subsidies to renewables uh, as well, and they'll create a subsidy-free playing field, which is actually rather difficult because the subsidy to fossil fuels is making them not pay for the destruction of the conditions for life on planet Earth, well, which will be very expensive to pay for. And there's no such price tag that renewables are, are alleviated of. But, but to your point on, um, on precedence, I actually am not so sure about that. So this has been some really good writing um, about marijuana decriminalization, legalization and decriminalization. I can't remember the name of the guy. I, he wrote a great book. I wrote a great book called let us get free. He was a prosecutor in the District of Columbia and you know, found that he couldn't get convictions of black kids with black, mostly black juries and for who are being, being tried for possession of small amounts of cannabis. And even when the facts were all there, the juries just would not convict and they were getting nullifications all over the place. And then it created this kind of cascade because the prosecutor said, well, why should I waste my time, you know, even prosecuting this person because we're not gonna get a conviction. It's just gonna clog up the courts. So the prosecutors were not raising charges. And then the police sort of said, well, why should I bother arresting this guy? Because he's not even gonna be charged. And so the police started to look the other way. And then finally the law changed, right? And so this is what I mean about that that juries can be law unmaking bodies. And if they do that long enough, then the word get, this is maybe a model of change that goes beyond the jury, but the word gets to the top and the law changes. 
Now, I don't think it's going to quite happen like that with fossil fuels. I don't think that they're taking out, taking my thought experiment out for it. I don't think that some Congress is going to so suddenly write legislation that says, okay, blowing up pipelines is great, and we'll even give you a tax break if you blow up pipelines. I don't think that's going to happen. But jury nullification can create informal precedents. How long would that take? What take? That process of jury nullification and like sort of unmaking the law. How long does it well, I think it would be a little faster than the Berlin, a little slower than the Berlin Wall. I mean, what you'd have to, you'd have to look carefully at where the jury pools are. So a huge amount of U.S. oil is moving by train now. There are seven places where train tracks cross the Rockies, um, seven well-placed piles of wet leaves on slopes would actually stop those trains. The only drawback is you don't find deciduous trees in that area so you'd have to ship wet leaves from a place like new hampshire by a fedex crossing state lines but you know what i'm saying is you'd, you'd have to be as a movement you'd have to think very carefully about where the jury pool is where the infrastructure is what the weak points are there are various websites that will allow you to track trains um there's one called railfans.com uh will allow you to track trains going anywhere and this is something that I'm interested in how data is used in the climate movement. Um, I think we're kind of getting past predictions and modeling and looking at real time information now. Um, so yeah, I think, I think a lot could be done in a small number of places by a small number of people. Um, I'm interested in how, how Mormons think on juries. That may be the next part of the project um, because a lot of them are well placed along the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. Mary. Um, thanks. This is really interesting. Um, two questions. So, one is just I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the history of nullification. So, it seems like it had this kind of pre revolutionary war moment where it's important here. Um, and then it gets it's made illegal, if I understood you right, for defense attorneys to bring it up as a possibility in trial. They can't accept for a few years in New Hampshire. Well, I'm not, it's still a gray area, I think. Um, I think if you mention the word during nullification, mm -hmm. you may get into hot water with the judge now in New Hampshire. So, so that's just, I mean, that seems, but then there are places and times where it takes hold, like you're talking about. Uh, marijuana convictions of use. So this seems like a really interesting history that maybe has to do with, I don't know, state power and there's some different cultural dynamics to it in places like New Hampshire. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. And also kind of the downsides. You kind of right. so, hinted at them. But. So jury nullification became famous because of racism. And the Emmett Till trial, which I believe was 1954, sometime in the 50s, an African American kid in Chicago gets beaten to death for looking the wrong way at a white woman. And the, the evidence is incredibly clear that it was murder. And he goes before an all white jury, and or no, the, the defendants go, the, the murderers go before an all white jury, and they get acquitted, right? Not guilty of murder. Um, the Rodney King trial in 1992, right? Cops beat up a black motorist. Uh, the trial goes to Simi Valley, which is kind of a right wing suburb. And the cops are all, it, it's all on video and everything. The cops are acquitted. So the underbelly of jury nullification is that, you know, juries are a wild card and people's consciences are not necessarily pure, right? And they're basically exercising prejudice in many cases. So this is why I say this is a climate strategy of last resort, because it creates the possibility for a kind of lawless anarchy. And I'm not an anarchist. I mean, I actually believe that a good section of the law is out there to protect the weak from the strong, right? And to protect people who are marginalized from people who are at the core of power. And I wouldn't want to see all those laws just thrown out. Right? So that's a risk. But the risk of failing in the climate movement is that we lose the laws, we lose agriculture, <laughs> we lose fisheries, 
we lose the means of sustenance for a good chunk of 8 billion people on planet Earth, right? And to my mind, that's worse. So we've got two, we've got two, we've got one bad option, which we know and has been bad going back to Emmett Till and earlier than that. And then we have a horrific option, which includes that bad option, and then worse stuff still. So, you know, what I, what I, way I try to describe this is there, there are the denialists, like the libertarians, and then there are the soft denialists, who are most people of goodwill. And, you know, like the people I deal with when I'm talking to Rutgers University and trying to get them to cut carbon emissions. And they say, well, yeah, you're right, David and all you people. We are gonna, we are gonna go carbon neutral by 2040 and we're gonna, uh, it's gonna be expensive and we have a list of priorities and we're gonna start with the hard stuff in 2030. And we're gonna, you know, do this, do this, do this other kind of accounting trick, and we're gonna make it pan out. Give us some time to put the pieces together and to make this happen. And that's a kind of soft denialism because it's denying the urgency, right? And it's denying the priority. And it's saying something like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna lose $50 million, lose $50 million this year on our football program but we're only going to go solar if we can make $50 million through the right kind of power purchase agreement that will take us three years to negotiate and will be a fairly small thing anyway, right? So that's a good way to think if it's 1970 and you've got a lot of time to do things methodically and maybe do optimize everything, but it's not 1970, it's the 2020s. We lost, we don't have, we lost the time for slow and methodical. And now we kind of got to do things in a more panicked way, <laughs> right? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, I guess I just had one question like about what would happen after, for instance, like a, a well-placed pile of leaves on the train tracks, like, and a successful nullification. Would, would that, in, would it take many instances of that to happen? Would it, and then what would be, I guess, procedurally in your mind, like the things that would come up after that point? Right, good question. So part of this, and this would be in, in the book, I'm working on a book that would be called something like uh, plus 1.2 degrees um, resistance and resignation under early climate change. Um, part of what I think climate change, in addition to minimizing the risk it also doesn't have the right periodization. And it's not an on and off switch. There are different phases, but will be different phases. But to answer your question there about the, so part, part of what's gonna be in the book is a ration plan. Um, so in, 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 if you put that pile, that pile of leaves would be scraped away pretty quickly and people would go to try on whatever. What you need to do is the next day, another group of people put a pile of leaves and the next day and the next day and the next day. And so you need to have enough people willing to do this, risking arrest, but having a pretty good likelihood of not being convicted, right? So you need to have waves of civil disobedience blocking this train pretty reliably, which means that fossil fuel doesn't get somewhere. And this has got to happen faster than the buildup of renewables is happening. The buildup of renewables is happening very slowly, right? And unfortunately, uh, our government has prioritized, it's, still, it's happening slowly, even though the government has prioritized building up renewables and postponed retiring fossil fuels until a later date, right? And that's in fact exactly backwards because the one thing we need to do to stabilize the conditions for life and so on is retire renewables. Building those offshore wind farms that are planned, offshore turbines that are planned for New Hampshire and Massachusetts, those don't actually do anything to reduce carbon emissions. They have a zero effect on the conditions for life on planet Earth. What has an effect on life on planet Earth is shutting down fossil fuels. So we do that quickly. And then there's a shortage of electricity. If it's, if it's really effective, it's gonna hurt. Now you can, you can start with exports, right? Like there's a group that uh, blocked a train, a pretty short train bringing, um, what was it, train? Bringing liquefied natural gas to Everett, Washington. And they, the judge, the judge gave them a light sentence or something with a wink and a nod. Uh, and you know, 
you'll find a lot of sympathy for blocking exports because American juries don't care very much about somebody else's energy. Um, but we're also going to have to block local energy usage. And so, you know, we need to conserve them. Right? So what does a rationing plan look like? Well, look, we've been talking about actually in the consumer liaison group of ISO New England of the grid operator is that there are gentler forms of rationing. One thing is to price electricity so that people use it during the times when it's more available and use less of it when it's less available. As solar comes more online, then people will be using electricity during the day and less of it at night. And then, you know, there's load shedding. And there are different ways of protecting the people who have medical devices at homes and hospitals, of course, and shedding the load of people like me living in a small town don't really need that much electricity, certainly not every hour of the day. I have an article in Boston Review called Give Up the Demand for Constant Electricity. So it would be irresponsible, I think, to really interfere with the supply chain if you don't offer a, um, a means of coping, at least imagine a means of coping. Let's uh, thank you.